Hello, and thank you for joining the Organic Educational Conference as part of the 2021 Virtual Southeast Regional Fruit and Vegetable Conference. I am Mackenzie English, Program Assistant with the University of Georgia Horticulture Department in Griffin, Georgia, and will be the moderator for this presentation. Pesticide CEU and CCA credits are available for most presentations offered during the live SC Regional Conference. Check the Pesticide CEU guide for a list of approved presentations in participating states. The Pesticide CEU guide is located in the Event Resources tab under the Media Player. The guide is also available at the Resources Center located on the main menu of the conference platform. Please note, pesticide credits will only be available for one, registered attendees, and two, only during the live conference. Credits will not be av available for on-demand viewing. There is a simple three-step process to receive pesticide CEU and CCA credits. First, go to the audience chat box located on the left side of your screen and type your first name, last name, and the states for which you are requesting credits. Again, go to the audience chat box located on the left side of your screen and type your first name, last name, and the states for which you are requesting credits. You will need to do this for every presentation to request CEU credits. The second step is to sign out at the end of every presentation. To sign out, go to the audience chat box and type your first name, last name, and the states for which you are requesting credits. You will be reminded to sign out at the end of the presentation. The third step is to complete the pesticide CEU registration. You only have to complete this registration one time during the conference. This is not required with every presentation. To access the pesticide CEU registration web link, open the pesticide CEU guide on the event resources tab located under the media player. The pesticide CEU registration web link is located on the front cover of the guide. This presentation is pre-recorded to reduce technical difficulties. We'll be answering your questions live at the end of the presentation. You can submit a question at any point during this presentation by typing your question in the questions box and pressing send. Don't forget to thank our 2021 conference sponsors and exhibitors by visiting the virtual trade show and featured products pavilion. Lastly, don't forget to join us each morning for coffee chats and each evening for networking. Check the conference agenda for details. Now I'd like to introduce Robert Westerfield, a faculty member in the Holder Culture for the University of Georgia at the Griffin campus, who will be presenting sweet corn varieties for smaller diversified organic growers. Bob has been with the University of Georgia for 32 years and served as a state specialist on fruits and vegetables. His primary focus is working with consumers and small grower operations. He tries to emphasize practical and environmentally safe practices to help increase yield and quality. Bob and his wife live on a farm in Middle Georgia where they raise their own beef, fruit, and vegetables. His topic today will explore better alternatives to growing widely popular sweet corn for small market growers. It's my pleasure to introduce Bob Westerfield. Well, hey folks from virtual land, I'd certainly rather be in person like we usually do given this talk, but uh, you know, you got to do what you got to do in these hard times. And uh, you know, if you're like me, probably one of your most favorite vegetables in the entire garden, whether you're selling it or growing it for yourself is sweet corn. It's certainly a popular uh, vegetable I've grown for the market before, and it's one that everyone looks forward to. And in many cases, it's kind of a very short season thing. So uh, you, know, you got to get it when you got it. And uh, it's, it's one of those things that everyone has kind of come to look forward to in the summertime. But you know, certainly there um, is a lot of discussion when it comes to varieties. And of course, everyone kind of knows the basic queen of the garden, and that is silver queen. And who hasn't heard of silver queen corn? As I travel the state and, and uh, move around, you know, every time I give a talk on sweet corn, protect, particularly to consumers and ask, well, what's your favorite corn? They all come up with silver queen. And that's just because it's been grown for so long. It's been around, it's a household name. Also when consumers go to buy corn seed, you know, at the feed store and so forth, it's probably gonna be the one most readily available. 
and I'm not going to knock silver queen corn. I have grown it before. My father-in-law grew it for decades. It's a great sweet corn. As you know, corn is divided by genetic types. So silver queen is sort of the old sweet type. It's called an SU corn. Okay. It's got some sugariness to it, but it, it's old school. And while there's nothing wrong with it, there are certainly some better selections out there that have got some real benefits for the grower. And that's what we're going to look at today. So we're not throwing out silver queen. You probably still want to have a little bit of available when someone says, that's what my grandmother grew. That's what I want. I got to have it. So, hey, you want to sell it if it's there, but let's look at some alternatives for you that might be able to extend um, your marketability for the corn and also look at some different um, differences in the varieties. So why would you even want to think about a hybrid variety? Well, I think the main difference uh, that I see in, in having grown hundreds of different varieties is going to be the sugar content. Yeah, Silver Queen is fresh and tasty, probably the day you harvest it, maybe a day or two later, but it certainly, as we know, turns to starch very quickly. It goes downhill. Um, it is converting to starch quicker than most varieties. When you try the new hybrid varieties, what you're getting is higher sugar content. Um, that sweetness and firming, firmness is going to last much longer than the older varieties. Of course, you know, some people like yellow corn, white corn, bicolor. Well, you can find that now in, in the hybrid varieties in all different colors of that corn that's unavailable. Um, there's a lot of improved resistance and increased yield when you try some of these newer varieties that are available. Now, you know, some folks get a little concerned when I say hybrid corn. They're like, I don't want to grow hybrid corn. I just want to stick with, you know, Silver Queen. Well, Silver Queen is a hybrid corn. And, you know, most of y'all probably know, but there's a difference between hybrid and GMO. And you might need to explain that to your customers. In the most simplistic way, hybrid corn is corn that we have selected and bred. We're crossing two parent plants and eventually we come up with these seeds, the seedlings, that after we select over and over and over, we come up with a variety that we really like. And that's a hybridized corn that has been done through breeding. A GMO is genetically modified. It's when we're actually taking an organism, in most cases, not even related to that vegetable, and we're putting it into that corn, okay? Uh, a good example, you probably have heard of Roundup Ready corn, or even BT corn, Bacillus thuringiensis, that's incorporated into the seed so that it exhibits that trait um, when you're growing it. So we're going to stay away from the GMOs. That's a whole nother topic. And, and um, we're going to stick to the hybrid corns that are, again, they're crossbred to come out with the best qualities that you're looking for. You know, are there any negatives to growing these improved sweet corn varieties? Well, maybe a couple. Um, certainly the seed might be more expensive than your, your typical um, corn that you see. And again, I'm going to go back to the Silver Queen or Trucker's Favorite or some of those older varieties, you might get them pretty cheaply. Um, sometimes they're not quite locally available, but I'll tell you what, you know, with the, just like this program being on the computer, you can go online, um, Harris Seed, Roop Seed, um, Jung Seed, you go to about any one of them and they've got a huge variety of the sweet corns that we're talking about today. And uh, you can certainly pick them up, you know, over the, over the uh, computer real easily. And when I mention the varieties here in a few minutes, I am just tipping the iceberg, okay? There's so many out there. I'm just picking some of the ones that I've worked with and have done well. So just realize it's not the uh, inclusive list when I, when I mention the sweet corn varieties. There's plenty of them out there to try. Um, you know, one of the other maybe drawbacks is sometimes we have to really worry about isolation. Um, when we talk about isolation, there are some real sensitive uh, genetic types in there, particularly the super sweets. We don't want to be growing those next to, say, an SU gene. So the super sweets or SH2 gene corn, um, it can cross pollinate and then you wind up with something that's kind of chewy or tough. So you have to worry about, depending on the genetic type you're growing, uh, about isolation in some case. And isolation means basically either planting it at a different time period, you know, staggering the planting dates so that they're not, um, you know, silking and, and tassels coming out at the same time, or it means a distance isolation. And distance can be defined, in my opinion, as being at least 100 or 200 yards away from each other. Some of these really multi-gene super sweet corns are very sensitive to cool soils. So you have to be cognizant that, hey, is the soil temperature warm enough? And what's warm enough? I'm going to say somewhere in the high 60s to 70s, and we're talking soil temperature, uh, before we plant these things. Otherwise, germination can really go downhill quickly. 
And then, of course, there's this, you know, consumer hesitancy. Hey, you know, that's, that's a hybrid corn. And we talked about the whole thing a second ago, GMO and hybridization, um, or it's new. I don't know if it's going to be that good. So, you know, the way we did it on our farm is we would always stick a few ears of corn that someone did not order, but we'd say, hey, try this new sweet corn, see what you think. Once people have tried it, um, they're usually hooked. And they're like, yeah, I like that a lot better than the silver queen we used to get. So, you know, it's, it's consumer education that you've got to do. You've got to say, hey, you know, this is something that's really better. Uh, it's not GMO, but it's just a real huge improvement over the old silver queen. So real simplistically, um, genetic type corn, broken down into several categories. The silver queen is the sugary, we call it the SU gene corn. There's several of them out there um, that have been around a long time. The next stage up uh, in, in, in hybridization is the sugary enhanced. That's the SE corns, and there's certainly a number of those out there. They're gonna definitely be an improvement over the SU corns. Now you're gonna have a higher sugar level and a little bit longer storage time, you know, once you pick those and put them into cool storage. We jump up significantly into the sugar category when we go to the super sweets. The super sweets are the SH2, okay, that's the gene type. These are going to have the highest sugar content. The downside of this we mentioned earlier is they really need some warm soils for germination. They also need to be planted either as one variety of SH2 or you can even put two SH2 corns together, but you can't mix them with the other gene types or you're going to get cross-pollination. Then you'll, other, you'll see some other words out there, the synergistic types. This is going to be a combination. We call these the multi-gene corns, and I really am big on these. I like them. They're, you're getting some of the benefits of SU and, in some case, SE corns mixed in with S, SH2 gene corns. They're crossing those to come up with uh, kind of a, a great corn that has a lot of attributes. Um, these would be kind of moderate in the sugary type content, and then the improved super sweet, um, and in and, and a second, we'll look at some other names for these. Um, this is where you're going to have basically a half component of SU corn um, blended in with a full component of the SH2. And again, these are going to have very high storability and sugar content. Now, this slide's a little bit confusing, but this is what I'm getting back to on the isolation um, thing we talked about. There are just some corns you can't plant next to each other. You're never really going to take a standard sugary and SU corn um, and, and put it next to a super sweet, or otherwise you're going to get some pollination problems. If you look at this, and this is actually right out of the Harris Seed catalog, so you can kind of get to this yourself, or if you go on their website, Harris Seed, you can see this slide. I kind of took it from them, uh, but it just shows that you can actually um, plant the sweet breeds, which are which the uh, synergistic, uh, sweet breeds, I'm sorry, and also the synergistic and the sugar enhanced can go together, as well as the SH2 and the SHA, which are the augmented super sweet, can be planted together. Sugary, standard sugary, which was the Silver Queen and some others, they're almost always going to be kind of planted off to the side, off, off, off on their own if you're going to grow some of those. But this just shows, and I don't have time to go into it, but all the breakdown of how much of each gene they have, whether it be the SE types, the SH2s, and it's a real handy kind of thing to look at. And it gives you a kind of a breakdown of where to put them on your isolation. All right, so let's look at some specific varieties. And again, this is not an exhaustive list, but some of the ones I've worked with before have done quite well, and I think they're a great improvement. You know, everybody wanted the Silver Queen corn. Well, here are the white varieties, Silver Queen being white. Well, if, if they got to have that, at least go to Silver King. Silver Queen was an SE gene. Silver King is an, I'm, I'm sorry, Silver Queen was an SU corn. Silver King is an SE corn. So it's a sugary enhanced. It's got a higher sugar content you would not be able to tell the difference between it and and the Silver Queen if you just looked at it and tasted it. But if you waited a couple of days, yeah, this is going to have more sugar content in it. So bump up to the Silver King. If everyone's calling for the Silver Queen, you would might try to get them to kind of go over to that one. Going up a little bit, um, we've got the Synergistic Corn, the SY Corn. This one's called Avalon. I have grown it before. It's a very sweet corn. It's got a wonderful flavor. Um, it it's, it's a little bit longer corn. It's going to take about 80 to 82 days for maturity, but it's got a super eight inch full ear. Um, it, it's wonderful taste and flavor, and it's just one of those that you might want to try. Okay, we grew Nicole last year, and it did very well. It's an, um, an SHA corn, so it's an augmented corn. 
Um, it is, once again, it's going to grow a nice eight, nine inch ear in some cases. It's extremely resistant to a lot of the diseases that you might see out there. Like every corn, you know, that we're not protecting in some chemical way, you can certainly be susceptible to some of the insects and, and particularly corn earworm. But this is a great corn to try. We had very good harvest results and yield, and it's just one that's out there. It's available by a lot of the companies we mentioned that were online. Mirage is another one that we've really had a lot of luck with. It's an SY corn. It's a combination, again, of, of some of the uh, super sweet and, and the SU variety um, corns. It's pretty much a mid-range corn as far as planting time in the 70s, as far as the number of days to maturity. But it's a great shape corn. It's just another one out there. We're going to show you a bunch of these, and then you have so many to pick from. Of course, you can, you can look them up online, read the descriptions, and, and get a pretty good idea if it's something that you think is going to work for you. All right, some folks are just into the yellow corn. Nothing wrong with that. They want a solid yellow variety. Well, what do we have out there? We're looking at the first one. Um, this is one, it's kind of like the Silver King. We bumped up over Silver Queen. Bodacious is one step above the SU corn. So it's a sugary enhanced corn. It's pretty popular. Um, folks are beginning to know this one. A lot of homeowners actually grow it. It's a 75 day corn to maturity. Um, it does have a lot of sugary, content that's going to last for several days. So if you pick it, don't get it all sold, you know, you keep it in cool storage, you should be able to get, you know, four or five days out of it, as opposed to something like a Silver Queen uh, or Trucker's, Trucker's Favorite. So it is a good one. Um, you know, I've, I've had it last up to almost 10 days before, and it's still very good fresh corn on the cob. And it's, it's a, you know, the ear is going to probably form up somewhere in the area of about maybe eight inches long. It's a fairly tall corn, um, probably gets to the height of about seven foot. This is Sweet Corn Vision. It's another one that's uh, offered by some of the companies. It's, it's a SHA corn. Um, it's extremely tender and flavorful. Um, I would say this is one of the better eating quality corns for yellow corn out there. Uh, it's a tall growing plant, can get up to seven foot tall, but it's got a great yield. In some cases on this one, you're going to get a bumper ear, you know, getting a second ear that's still marketable, or you can do like we do. A lot of times we sell it as seconds where someone wants creaming corn, corn that they're going to take off and cream, and it would certainly work for that. Okay, Candice is just another one we've got. Candice is an SHA corn that we have grown with pretty good results, um, had excellent yield, full to the end um, corn. It's going to have those refined genes in it that you're going to have the sugary content, be able to store it long term and, and still, you know, be able to market that stuff a week or two later, which is an excellent, um, you know, marketing tool when you only have a period of time to get that corn out. All right, my favorite probably is the bicolor selections. I just like a combination of the, the yellow and white, and I've grown probably more of these than anything. Um, again, we, we, we can look at a lot of different varieties out there. We grew this one on a couple of different trial sites. This one's called um, Cafe. It's an SY synergistic corn. Uh, it is not a very tall growing corn. It probably only tops out around five or six feet tall. The ears are maybe just a little bit smaller, but, the, but they are you know extremely flavorful a lot of sugar content. Um, it's a good early season corn for Georgia, and it's one I would certainly recommend. Okay, this is an organic seed corn. Now, some organic operations like to grow organic seed only, and you can certainly find that. You're going to be a little bit more limited, but this is one that's out there. Um, it's got a number to it, so not a real name. It's a 2171 SHA corn. Um, this one I have not grown, actually. But um, you know, in reading the description, I think it would wor work well for most growers in the state. Um, it is a super sweet variety primarily that's going to have a lot of sugar content, but it's going to have, of course, the isolation requirements, and it's also going to have to have the warm soil that we talked about. Providence, we've grown quite a bit of Providence. It is one of my favorites. Um, it is one that uh, has done very well. I get some of the longest ears of corn out of this. Um, it's great. Six, seven foot tall plants. We've grown this in North Georgia, middle Georgia, and parts of South Georgia. And this one has performed well. Um, we've even grown it on dry land operations, no water at all. And it's actually produced some really nice ears. So it's certainly one to look at. 
Rosie is another one we tried for the last two years. We were doing some trials for Harris seed uh, and it was, you know, we did some taste tests where we kind of sent around a lot of the corn to different um, folks to have them see which ones they thought were sweeter. And this one came back as one of the sweetest ones out there. So it's a wonderful bicolor corn, um, grows well, seems to be very resistant. Um, it's got really tight ears on it. So we didn't really have much of a problem at all with corn earworms. That tight ear formation at the tip seems to keep the corn earworms from penetrating in and causing issues. So I'd highly recommend it. All right, probably one of my favorites is, is the Montauk corn. That's not Indian name perhaps. Um, it's a synergistic one and I don't know, but I have grown this several years now and it just always seems to perform well. Again, the key is don't get it in the soil too quickly. Make sure your soil temperatures are approaching 70. Once you get this out there, I plant several successions of it, and I've always had tremendous corn and storability. I've pulled this corn out of the refrigerator two weeks later, and it'd still be extremely sweet. So it's an excellent advantage over some of the real fast starch, starchy type corns like the Silver Queen. Okay, finally, Sweet Chorus is another one we have trialed. And I want to mention again, uh, and this is one we call the sweet breed corn. It's actually a triple sweet, which means it's got multiple genes from SU, SH2, and SE corn in it. It is a really good one. I think the kernels on this one are a little bit firmer. Some people don't like that. It, they don't pop quite as easy as some of the other corns, but it's still, it's a very hardy, durable corn. Um, and I, I want to make the statement again that there are so many more varieties out there when you start looking through the catalogs, you might see something that appeals to you and, and you know, try a small quantity of it. But the general take home theme is that these multi-gene corns that we're talking about are just going to be so far superior to some of the older varieties that you're probably accustomed to growing or you're, you're getting a lot of requests for. And it's just going to give you more marketability that you can hang on to that corn and still have it, you know, quality after a week or even two weeks. All right, just real fast, I'm gonna go over just a couple of considerations when you're planting this stuff. Certainly, you know, soil preparation is key. You know about that. Um, we wanna make sure the pH levels are adequate. And by adequate, um, I'm gonna say in the high sixes. I always have best luck when I'm in the 6.0 to the 6.5 category on my pH. You can run that through your local county extension offices. They can run you a soil test. And obviously, if you know you got to raise it up, if you're acidic, you're going to probably be adding in some type of dolomitic limestone. If you happen to have over lime and you're up in the high alkaline category, then you're going to use some type of perhaps elemental sulfur. Usually, you're going to take that powder, liquefy it into some type of uh, water, and then spray that out to actually reduce the pH. We mentioned soil temperatures a lot. That's real important with sweet corn. Um, there's a lot of ways to tell a soil temperature. You can actually buy a soil thermometer. Really the best way is go to this website. It's our Georgia UGA weather site. It's um, georgiaweather.net. On that, you'll see a big map and you can click on the lo closest location to you and look at current conditions. That's gonna give you the soil temperature at any one time right there nearest to you. And it's a great way to gauge when you can grow your sweet corn. Um, you know, I mentioned this once, uh, staggering the planting times. I think this is a no-brainer for your experienced growers. But, um, you know, don't put it all on the ground at one time. You can get away by sometimes isolation by doing it by planting a one type of corn early and then coming in three weeks later and even planting a different genetic type because they're not going to cross-pollinate if they're growing at different times. Um, even if you planted the same variety, you could stagger the planting times. That way you have a continued harvest all through the warm months, all the way up to fall, basically. So try not to plant too much at one time. When you do plant corn, obviously you wanna put it in a number of rows, not just one or two long rows. I like to see three or four or more rows of it at a time to get good cross wind pollination. Got to keep the critters out. Always a problem for me. Um, fencing is one key to keep the deer, raccoons, and so forth. Doesn't really keep the raccoons out too much. I've tried repellents and other type things that are just so temporary they do not work. Uh, we use good metal kind of chain link fence. For deer, you're looking at seven and a half, eight feet tall. The deer will really play havoc on you. They might not even eat the ear of corn, but they'll eat the silk, and that's going to kill your pollination. We had mentioned corn earworms. Corn earworms are just a huge pest on corn. You might have heard of tomato fruit worm. Well, it's really the same critter. He just jumps from the tomatoes to the corn. Uh, it sometimes gets in the tips or usually gets in the tips, but sometimes it's going to actually penetrate in the center of the corn. Um, from an organic standpoint, really your only line of defense is going to be BT, Bacillus surgensis, that can be sprayed 
or some folks have tried using mineral oil sprays, using mineral oil near the tips. Um, it's just something, you know, at our farm, we know we're going to get some damage. We cut the tips off when we sell the corn and it just goes out like that. Weed control is always an issue in every garden, um, you know, and this happens to be part of my farm, actually, where I live in middle Georgia. Um, we are, we use a lot of weed block. It's a um, synthetic material that they use for erosion control, basically. We run it down the lines, and I actually plant corn, and I know it's not corn in this picture. You can see tomatoes, but we'll actually leave a little gap, and we plant the corn with a push planter um, right down those lines, so we've got a great place to walk, step, and, and we basically keep it virtually weed-free, except for, you know, right in the centers. You know, mulch is kind of difficult on corn, so whatever you can do, tillage, um, using weed fabric barriers and so forth. Some people even plant corn on plastic. Um, you have to try to keep those corn, the corn uh, weeds at bay to make sure you get a great harvest. You know, organic, it's always a challenge to get the nutrition, particularly the nitrogen of the corn. Um, using cover crops, particularly mixed with legume crops, be it sun hemp, um, winter peas, clover, that's going to add additional nitrogen into the soil when you till those in in the spring. So we always do cover cropping. Um, then it's going to be a combination of, of using um, probably multiple organic fertilizers, including, including probably some, some of the chicken products like the feather meal and other things a little bit higher, maybe fish meal in nitrogen to meet this, the requirements of corn, which is a pretty heavy feeder. Of course, corn loves water. Most critical time, um, you know, is going to be during the germination period. And then certainly as the corn begins to form up an ear, you want to make sure you get plenty of moisture to it. I like the drip tape, drip irrigation systems. I think it's by far um, the most effective. It's a great way to get the, you know, the water down to the soil. Some people use overhead systems and, you know, that's okay, but you're watering a lot of non-target non area. So I think, um, you know, having some type of a drip system is going to be the way to go. There's hard pipe. There's, a, you know, the drip tape, which I kind of look as almost a two-season deal, and then it's, ex um, you know, basically you're going to get rid of it. But it, having water to the corn is going to be essential. There are a few summers, certainly, w that we could have grown without irrigation. But you really want to be able to put the water to it um, when, it's, when it's most needed. OK, well, that's kind of a, a rundown real quick over uh, some of the sweet corn and the advantages of some of the hybrids we have out there. And I hope you'll probably give them a try. Um, we've got some publications online on growing sweet corn that you can look up on the University of Georgia. And you know, I think the biggest key is you know, can, you're, you're putting all that work and effort. And if you've grown sweet corn before, you know, it's almost, it's hard to make money on it. You have so much effort and time in it, but it's one of those vegetables you about have to have on hand because when people come from tomatoes and they come from peppers or everything else, they're going to want their sweet corn. Well, I think the key is, hey, how can we have sweet corn available for the longest period of time? And, and the way I look at it, um, you're, you're going to have to go to try some of these new hybrid varieties to where that sugary and that sweetness is going to last for several weeks on time. And then if you've kind of staggered your planting like we talked about, there's no reason in the world you couldn't have sweet corn available, you know, 24 seven throughout most of the growing period. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop and we're gonna go ahead and um, take some questions live. And I, I appreciate your, your time and, uh, you know, listening in today.